So last time we looked at these two components, the AUS protocol, the garbled circuits and the oblivious transfer. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at how you actually combine them together into a protocol. So that's what today's going to be about. I'm going to concentrate on the AUS passively secure protocol. So we've got a passively secure OT, so that doesn't really matter. Okay. Recall we want to compute a function between two parties. We've got a function f, we've got an input x1, known by party 1, and input x2, known by party 2. And party 1's want to get an output y1, party 2 wants to get an output y2, and y1 could be different from y2. Okay, so that's what we're trying to achieve. What we're going to do is we're going to divide the um, parties into the party 1, who we're going to call the garbler. They're going to be the one that encrypts the circuit in the way we said last time and party two, who's going to be the evaluator, is going to evaluate the circuit. And the first step is that the garbler is going to garble the circuit. They produce the set of garble gates, G, and they produce two input wire tables, I1 and I2, which is, remember, these are for each of the input wires. This is the two labels corresponding to whether that wire is zero or wire is one. So the keys corresponding to the wires. So they do that for the input table, input wires, and also for the output wires for both parties. We'll separate these into the I1 and I2 because we've got inputs for party one and party two, and we've got different outputs for party one and party two. In step two, the garbler sends all those gates over to the evaluator, to party two. Now what they also do is they now also send over the values corresponding to their inputs. So they take the, the table I1. Now suppose one of the wires in their input is wire W and they want to send the bit B, B equals zero or B equals one on that wire. So they have to choose one. They can either send zero or they can send one. But they want to keep it secret whether they send zero or one. But what they actually do is they therefore send the wire label KWB for the specific value of B. Now notice this reveals nothing about the actual input value B because the value KWB is just some random piece of nonsense. Also what the um, circuit garbler does at this point is send over the output wire table corresponding to party two's output. We'll call that O2, remember. So that's step two. Step three is we now need to get the input corresponding to party two over to party two. Now, party two has got, a, for every wire, he's got two possible values. He's got zero or one. And we want to send him over the wire label corresponding to his specific input. And that's exactly what OT is. What it is, is for every wire that uh, player two has as input, player two is the receiver. He has a single bit, what bit he wants to enter on that wire. But that's his input into the OT protocol. And the sender has two wire labels, KW0 and KW1. So he inputs that as the sender into the OT protocol. And so the receiver, supposing player two has wanted receiving bit zero, he learns KW0, but he doesn't learn KW1 by the properties of the OT protocol. So this is where OT is used in step three. Now, what's the receiver got? He's the circuit evaluator, he's got the garbled circuit, He's got the input wire labels corresponding to player one's input. And he's got the input wire labels corresponding to his own input. So he can just evaluate the circuit and he gets the output wire labels. Now he can already decode his own output because he's got the output wire table O2. So that allows him to decode the output Y2. Now for output Y1, all he's got is these wire labels and he doesn't know what they correspond to. So he just sends those wire labels back to player two in step five, who can now decode. And that's it. Very, very simple, very simple protocol. It's five step procedure, garble, send, OT, evaluate, and then resend the result back for player one to get his output. Very simple. But it's not that efficient, so we're gonna make it more efficient. So let's see how we can make it more efficient. So we go back and actually look at how we garbled the circuit. It's very 
wasteful the way we described it last time. We needed an CCA encryption scheme. The evaluator, when he decrypted a table, had to decrypt four ciphertexts, of which he only was interested in one. So he's to do four decryptions, of which he knows beforehand three are going to be nonsense. So we want something simpler and faster. And how do we do this? So what we do is we use these things called signal bits. So we still keep the keys corresponding to wires, these labels, but we also pick a random bit, row i, which is for every wire. And then for every wire, we actually have the wire value, zero or one, and then we encrypt the wire value with one of these row i's for each row i. And this gives us an external value, a signal value, and we're gonna see how that's gonna allow us to evaluate the gate. Again, we're gonna go through a simple example with an AND gate. Again, like we said last time, we fold the NOT gates in, so we can just consider two input gates for the make things easier. So let's start with an AND gate. Recall, we have the standard truth table. Now, the first thing we do is we come up with these row values, which are gonna encrypt the truth table. So these rows, in some sense, are keys which we use to encrypt the row tape, uh, uh, the, the AND uh, table. So we've got WI is the message, we encrypt it with row I, and we get EI. So with these particular choices of rows here, we get this encrypted truth table here, step one. Step two, we now encode the message, but we encode the message as the key we want to output, this is KK0, 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 KK1, but then we also concatenate the EK value because this EK value is public. It doesn't matter what it is. Okay, so we can put it there. And this depends, of course, on the row K value. Now what we do is we encrypt that entire message with the two keys like we did last time. So we get this as the encryption scheme. Fine, that's great. And now we reorder like we did before, we do a permutation. So look, here's the standard truth table order. And now we've reordered it in some random way, fine. And now what we do, we throw away everything. So we just keep the external values of the inputs, which just look random because we can then place them in a standard order. It's E0, E0001, 1011, standard order. And then we have the encryptions corresponding to them. But notice that this breaks, because these are encryptions of the actual values in the truth table, this zero zero doesn't correspond to the one zero here. That's because we've got the encryptions with respect to the row. So if we look at this, if you know the external value, you know exactly which row to go to. And then because you've got the row that you want to go to, you can decrypt only that row and it gives you the next external value, which reveals no information because it's been encrypted by row and we can keep going on. And that's what we call a garbled gate. So how do we do evaluation? So let's assume that we've got the wire label, external value for each wire has been learnt. It tells you nothing about what the actual value is because the wire label is a random key external value is an encryption of that specific bit via this bit thing. So it's just a one-time path encryption. So imagine that we learn that EI is equal to one. We call it row I is one. And we learn that EJ is equal to run. Okay. So we learn KI zero and KJ one because of these keys here, but we don't know that this corresponds to zero. We don't know that this corresponds to one. So we know what they are, we know what these labels are, but we don't know what they correspond to, even though we know these external values, these so-called indicator bits. With the indicator bits, because the two indicator bits are 1, 1, we know we can decrypt the last row, the, the 1, 1 row of the table. So that's the only thing we bother encrypting, decrypting. So we decrypt this, we learn KK0, and we also learn the external value 1, and then we can carry on. So that's how gain evaluation works. We only have to decrypt one row. And because we only have to decrypt one row, we don't need an NCCA encryption scheme because we don't need the other rows to return perp. The other rows are just going to return nonsense now. 
because if we decrypt something with the wrong keys, we will get nonsense. But we don't need to detect its nonsense. So we don't need the NCCA capability in the encryption scheme. So the encryption scheme could be much simpler. Again, we change the garbled circuit valuation. The wire is exactly the same, except the wire label tables are now the wire um, index, the two labels, and then the two external bits there. So that's what we keep as the wire label table. What's the encryption scheme? Well, if we kind of imagine that we're using AS as 120-bit blocks, we can use an encryption scheme that's kind of a bit like this. So we can think of uh, BK as AS encrypting a block. We take the two wire values here, saw them together, um, and get with the gate label, and then so on. Okay, so what we're doing is we what we're essentially doing here is we're creating a encryption scheme with two keys, which encrypts a key and a bit. So we think of these now as 127 bit values, so we can still keep the 128 bit block. We apply AES here, which we um, kind of randomize by the gate label, so we can have you know, different fan in, fan outs of the gates here. Saw so that again with that, and then put the message in there. So it's a kind of like, this is kind of like a mode of operation for producing the encryption scheme. This is kind of a standard one that people use. The next optimization we can do is what's called the freeze all technique. And remember, if we kind of got two gates, every we can express a function in terms of two gates, we can express it in terms of AND gates and ZOR gates, okay? So they give us everything, they're universal. And what we'd like to do is actually get rid of all the linear gates. If you kind of looked at the lectures on linear secret sharing schemes, we saw that linear functions were for, for free when we did LSS-based MPC. We'd like linear functions to also be for free when we do YAO. So what's a linear function in YAO? That's ZOR. So we'd like ZOR to be for free. So that's why we have the free ZOR technique. So now what we do is instead of choosing the, the, these labels completely at random, we choose one label at random, but then the second label, we make it as ki zeros or a delta where delta is fixed across the entire circuit. So the zero label is chosen at random, but the one label is chosen as the zero label zor this fixed delta. Remember, you're only ever going to reveal one of those labels any one time, so you never actually reveal delta through the protocol. So we can then add our signal bits in as usual. Okay, that's no problem. But then the free ZOR technique, imagine that we wanted to compute a ZOR gate. Well, this is the value that the key that you, the value of the string that you get associated to the um, wire i this is the value of the string you get for wire j and if you saw these two strings together you actually get the output of the zor gate so zoring the two strings gives you the string as the output of the zor gate so there's no need to do a garbling for zor gate so this gives you zor for free which is kind of like given that a lot of circuits have huge numbers of zors this means that we only have to compute the AND complexity of a circuit when looking at the complexity for garbled circuits evaluation in MPC. So that's the end of this little how we use, how we use garbled circuits and how we use OT to produce a passively secure two-party protocol for a secure function evaluation. We've looked at how you make garbled circuits more efficient when the two classic things here are the freeze or technique and this kind of thing with the indicator bits and the external values. So there, there are other optimizations you can do. There are so-called half gates and uh, row reduction techniques and all sorts of other things you can do to make this go much faster. But just with you know these basic things, you can have a very, very efficient two-party passively secure protocol. What we're going to do next time is look at seeing how to make this actively secure. So hope you understood that and um, hope to see you next time. Bye.